in November, completed NaNoWriMo um, about 10 o'clock on the last day of November. So done, but not not too, not unhappy, not happy with it. Somewhere, somewhere in the middle. Maybe I'll go back to it, maybe not. What you're seeing on the screen will explain because I realized as I was going through cleaning up things in the background that I don't think I've ever actually explained what all of those archetypes we made back on uh, throughout the year were for. I mentioned the world book and Arisa, but I, I never actually explained what this, I guess, this all is. And so I figured this would be a great time to go ahead in uh, now that we're in December to go ahead and just go over it nice, quick and easy. Arissa is the name of the current homebrew that I run for the people that I know for Dungeons and Dragons. And I think that playing in a homebrew world is a different experience than running or playing in a pre-existing setting like the realms. And it's really important that everyone understands I'm saying different, not better. There's real garbage homebrew and pre-existing stuff out there. And there's really good pre-existing stuff or homebrew out there. And honestly, even some of that garbage in both camps can be really fun with the with the right group, with the right approach. So just because I prefer to run with homebrew like this doesn't mean that you should take it as a knock on the pre-written things. So what is Arissa? It's my attempt to create a high fantasy world that takes the concept of high fantasy and really does actual high fantasy it's something familiar enough that people can pick it up if they want and ignore you know the the big themes or the weird physics of it all and just play in a fun world that they sort of zoom in on and ignore all of it but all of it is obviously the reason that if you've ever made homebrew you're making it because you enjoy making worlds like this or however whatever worlds you want so Everything I'm going to say is specifically about either creating homebrew or this specific world itself. You don't necessarily need to go as big or in-depth with creation myths or things like that. You could, can just say this is what the world is like, but I think that if you're going to be creating a whole world for your NPCs and players to live and play in, diving into this both on a thematic level as well as the actual setting will help you with your world design and your adventure design. You probably realize I put a lot of thought and idea into things like themes judging by all of the Descent into Avernus videos where we go into character and theme a little more than the book is able to do in part because the book is restrained by publication dates, uh, page limits, things like that. But for Arissa, I get to basically just do whatever I want. I'm unconstrained by all of those things, and so I'm going to take advantage of that. I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the theme of it, and I think themes should be broad strokes, right? So for this, I wanted to focus on the idea that we're going to use the term humanity for all sentient creatures here just because it's it's easier and what we think about humanity is that they're special because being sentient they get to choose not just what they do but why they do it and this this is what elevates these these people that we're going to be telling these stories about to be you know important and interesting enough that we want to tell these stories choice is what makes our major players in the our major players in the world, right? But what are they going to be choosing between? We don't want it to just be good and evil, right? We need powerful forces behind humanity that is, you know, forcing them to do things. But it can't just be good and evil, right? Because good and evil, there's no interesting choice there. You should almost every time pick good. And if you ever try to justify picking evil, you're probably wrong. But we'll stick with almost always just in case to, you know, keep someone from making an argument. So instead, you want large powers that are flawed and flawed. That way, your players are able to make choices that are interesting, 
but it also they can do this do what we're hoping they're going to do right we're hoping that they're going to be heroic because this is high fantasy we want them to see that these choices that these larger than life bigger than humanity forces are trying to make them make we want them to be able to be i think maybe calling them existentialist heroes isn't isn't perfect but it's a good phrase for them realizing that these are false choices that they're going to be given that's they're going to need to assert that no 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 humanity is better than what you're giving us to choose from and so we've decided what we want to do is morally right and fair and we're willing to do that even in the face of superhuman opposition so that's the thematic part and you can do that in almost any setting and i feel like I end up doing that in almost any setting because that's a much more interesting story. But you also still need to have a place for an adventure, right? You need the high fantasy world for your existentialist high fantasy concept. And I mean, obviously, we're going to have things that make it different from our real world, right? We're going to have magic. We're going to have dragons. We're going to have dwarves. We're going to have elves. But that's not enough for high fantasy, in my opinion. Your world needs to feel radically different, fundamentally, from not just how our own world works, but how people in that world interact with it. So that as the players are going through, they'll every now and then just hit something that feels alien enough to them that they're like, oh yes, this is a totally different world, but not so alien that you turn them off and off of your adventure. So, for Arissa, I've come up with three main areas and we're finally getting to my ugly ugly paint drawing that the adventure happens in and if you're interested at all in the cosmology or whatever these three zones are essentially where any setting of adventure is going to occur in one of these three major places you could break down each of them into smaller more interesting discrete areas but in general one of these three settings is where the bulk of the adventure is happening and it's going to inform you a little bit about what the world your players are going to be in will be like we're going to gloss over the creation myth as we go we'll touch on it and we might go a little more deeper than i initially thought we would before i start talking about it but only so much as that you need to understand the setting we're going to start here the sun the unmoving sun god's palace Basically, it's exactly what you what it sounds like. It's where we started our creation myth, right? It's the giant floating home for our, our sun god, his court, his wife, his armies, and followers. If you've seen all of the discussions of the archetypes that we created, you understand that he also has got a whole bunch of celestial bees that he uses to send out into planes to terraform, terraform places. His court is kind of high tech compared to the rest of our fantasy world in which this is where we're giving a home for warforged artificers crafters so that it's this nice mixture of magic and technology not quite eberron more it should feel very mystical and alien as opposed to steampunk whenever players in any other zone encounter what we're calling artifice it needs to feel weird, alien. It should not function in the same way. So if they find uh, some sort of ranged weapon made from artifice, it shouldn't feel like it's just a bow but different. It should have a different way of interacting with the world that just is alien for people not from here. But this isn't enough. We need to have some conflict here. So obviously... It's a palace, there's court intrigue, there is a new court stranger is what our world book calls them to give whoever picks it up as much room as they need to decide who is this court stranger, what is this mysterious entity that has been uh, whispering in the ear of the sun god ever since a tragedy occurred. This tragedy is what brings us to uh, Arissa, the world serpent. Long, long, long ago, at the start of this whole whole world, Arissa was just a tiny, tiny little venomous snake that was a pet of the sun god's daughter, 
daughter, Norella. Something happened, terrible accident, baby tiny snake bites bites the 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 sun god's daughter, and as punishment for accidentally killing her, the sun god grabs his spear, which is the ever bright, which we'll discuss later, and pins Arissa the World Serpent all the way down. We don't even go into details because it doesn't matter how long ago it was, how far down it is, just really, really long ago, really, really far down. Pins Arissa to the ground below and essentially thinks, there we go, I've gotten my revenge, life is, life is able to move on. As time passes, Arissa becomes, as you can guess by the name, the World Serpent, so large that you have whole adventures on this, this snake, which has, you know, covered itself in mountains and plains. It's, a, it's an entire world on itself, and it starts spiraling up the Everbright in a go goal to grow large enough to literally swallow the sun. There we go. We now have our conflict between two opposing forces. You've got the sun god on all his righteous anger at the uh, this world serpent's uh, accidental, maybe deliberate murder of of his daughter, and you have this world serpent that is just an animal enraged at being attacked. And then you have all of the people who live in both of these places trying to reconcile as these two forces try and destroy each other. Our third zone, we've already talked a little bit about, is the Everbright. Now we called it a spear, but that's maybe not the best way to really explain it. It's a massive creation of what we were calling artifice back when we were talking about the Sun God's Palace. We might call it a spear, but you probably would be better to think about it as a giant interplanar warship that he essentially is, maybe, well, is, was, was one of the sun god's biggest weapons to defend, defend this plane. So, because Arisa the World Serpent was turning into a god, the sun god not wanting have to, you know, have an actual fight deity to deity, turned his spear down, tried to use it to kill Arissa, it failed, and now this giant ship is stuck in the ground, and all of it, all of the people who live inside of it, work inside of it, who just happened to be there the day that this happened, for however long ago to whenever you choose to start the adventure, have been living in this falling apart ship, which has got tears to various different planes because it was meant to be an interplanar weapon, all sorts of artifice on the inside that has gone wrong, a whole bunch of people who have been trapped there for perhaps generations who have just given up on the sun god entirely, and you've got this whole little cosmos in there that both doesn't care about the sun god anymore. Maybe some of them do. They're trying to get back. And then you've got Arisans who basically have this giant treasure trove that they can raid. But if they do go in there, they need to get in and out very quickly before the world serpent continue, continues coiling up past the Everbright and accidentally leaves them behind forever. And there it is. If you were following and care, which maybe you don't, about the archetypes, this is the world that they live in. And um, also just one of my many classic goofy paint drawings that I occasionally show my players to be like, here, let me explain this to you. As we go forward, I'll try and do more Descent into Avernus uh, videos. I think we have a, uh, I have a little bit more I need to do to get ready for the next session, and then maybe we'll be able to solve that out. And then we'll talk a little more about homebrew and just talking about the world, the world book, because it helps me, and I don't know. It'll be interesting. And then I think I know what my next uh, book report's going to be. I started reading it, and we'll, we'll see from there. Anyway, hope everyone enjoys, and happy December.